Well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for being here tonight. It's my uh, absolute pleasure to get to speak to you all. Um, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation after this because, you know, I'm a historian. I spend a lot of my time uh, reading newspapers from the 70s and 80s. Um, but I look around this room, and I, uh, I know a lot of you have lived this history. So I'm very interested in the, in the personal stories uh, that will come out of this conversation. In November 1974, in the midst of the pipeline boom, Alaskans did something truly remarkable. They elected a Republican environmentalist governor who had not only opposed Alaska statehood, but who had also opposed the construction of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System because of its threat to Prince William Sound. That unorthodox man was Jay Hammond. Under the eight-year administration of uh, Governor Hammond, Alaska transformed their political economy. Despite attempts to diversify the economy and insulate Alaskans from the corrosive nature of oil politics, through a series of unintended consequences, Hammond's tenure constructed a state uniquely reliant upon petroleum revenues. Ironically, the foundation of Alaska's oil-reliant political economy was cemented by leaders seeking to move Alaska away from oil. At the core of this new petro welfare state was the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, the largest private industrial project in history and a giant machine for extracting and moving Arctic oil. The realization of the pipeline proved an unparalleled opportunity to create and forge a new political regime. Alaskan politicians revolutionized the state's fiscal policy and forged not just a petro state, but a petro welfare state. And my use of this term uh, welfare is not a pejorative term. Uh, I'm not deriding the billions of dollars of revenue that have been spent on Alaskans over the past 40 years um, to in, in very real ways enrich their quality of life and economy. Um, I want to encourage us to think about welfare as state support for public well-being, which I imagine we should all be in favor of. So there are two critical ways that the pipeline and the petro welfare state are tied together. Um, and actually, Rich, if I can get you, or uh, there we go, Tristan, thank you. Tell, tell you what, if I just point at you, will you, there we go. Um, there, that's the one, perfect. Um, there are two critical ways the pipeline and the petro welfare state are tied together. First, the pipeline was the essential link to monetize the Prudhoe Bay oil field. In a very real sense, the source of the state's wealth is not just the oil itself, which is worth nothing in the ground. It is the pipeline which allowed the oil to be extracted, moved to market, and monetized. Look around, said State Representative Russ Meekins uh, to his constituents in the early 1980s. Everything you see, um, we can attribute to the pipeline. The schools we have, the streets that are paved. It's incredible. We're living off of that thing, end quote. The second aspect that connects the pipeline to the Petro State, um, as the only transportation infrastructure for North Slope crude, no Arctic oil flowed until Alyeska uh, completed the construction of the pipeline in 1977. Um, the flow through this massive artery proved overwhelming, reaching 1.2 million barrels per day within two years. Um, and it, you know, it was basically like a flood overnight. The state lurched from bankruptcy, literally surviving on a loan from the oil companies, to one of the richest states in the country almost overnight. As the state's main economic vein, the pipeline system supercharged Alaska's economy, but it gave it the stability of a pogo stick. The fiscal fortunes of the state thrived or dived depending on world oil prices and the flow of oil through the pipeline, a situation we all know too well. The centrality of the pipeline 
to the petrostate mattered not only in the 1970s, but today as the flow of oil through the pipeline dwindles. The budget crisis we face today is a structural economic problem created by the inception of the pipeline. Alaska's revenue crisis creates an opportunity to question the foundations of the petrostate and to re-envision the possibilities and potentialities of Alaska. And so I think a really important place to begin um, is this question of ownership, question of control over the means of production. So if this pipeline is, is this really uh, vital aspect for monetizing the oil, um, it's an important question of, okay, who is gonna control and own this resource? Um, and I think the best place to start is with Alaska's constitution. Alaska's long history as a resource, co resource colony weighed heavily on its uh, constitutional framers. For centuries, outside corporations like Kennecott Copper had come to Alaska to mine the territory's minerals and to seize the wealth of its fisheries without contributing to the improvement of the region. In drafting the state's 1958 constitution, Alaska's elder states men and women a key provision to future natural resource booms would provide maximum benefits to the state's populace. Minerals like oil and gas could be leased, but not sold outright to private corporations. This provided the, uh, the state and its residents with a permanent equity interest in the development of all minerals. Um, in short, this made Alaska into the so-called owner state, Wally Hickel's famous phrase. Um, but just because Alaskans owned their mineral resources uh, did not mean that they would control their economic destiny. Following the announcement of the proposed Alaska pipeline in February 1969, state legislators faced a pressing question. How would the state regulate the pipeline and ensure that the oil companies did not steal the people's oil wealth? In 1970, Governor Egan proposed uh, that the state own the pipeline outright. Um, Attorney General John Havelock um, recalled, Egan figured the industry would, quote, hornswoggle the state and without appropriate control over the means of production, quote, Alaska would be riding the tiger. The petroleum tiger is what he meant, facing head to head with multinational oil companies. The problem was simple. Whoever owned the pipeline had the ability to set a tariff, basically a price paid for moving the oil. The tariff could include costs incurred by building, maintaining, and operating the pipeline. Thus, whomever owned the pipeline controlled the ability to, dedu to deduct costs from the price of a barrel of oil shipped through taps. These deductions negatively impacted the state's tax revenue. Whether or not these deductions were fair was the multi-billion dollar question. Governor Egan and other Alaskans feared that multinational oil companies would use the pipeline as a tool for financial manipulation uh, to deprive Alaskans of their rightful share of the oil wealth. Egan warned Alaska's Speaker of the House, Eugene Guess, quote, these companies have purposely kept hidden the economics of North Slope production. In explaining uh, his public ownership push to the Anchorage uh, Daily News, Egan argued, argued that Alaskans should be, quote, mindful that the primary obligation of the companies involved is to their stockholders and the board members, thank you, <laughs> uh, to their stockholders and board members in New York, Los Angeles, and Houston. The sheer size of the enterprise in Alaska demands effective public control, or what we will have an economic state larger and more powerful than the political state which contains it. I think that's very prescient um, wisdom from Governor Egan. From the outset, the odds were tilted against the Egan administration. The state lacked technical expertise, the capital, and the administrative talent sufficient for undertaking such a massive and expensive project. Ultimately, the Alaska legislature, under pressure from Alaska and the oil industry, rejected Egan's plan to own the pipeline. While some oil companies, like Arco and BP, were opening, open to the state owning uh, partial interest, 12.5%, Exxon threatened to withdraw from the project if the state were given any ownership at all. Hardly anybody knows this. I found this from BT, BP's internal documents in London. Thus, Alaska failed to gain even partial ownership over the pipeline. Ultimately, Alaska got a slice of the pie, but not a seat at the table. 
In the final analysis over the past 40 years, oil companies have stolen billions of dollars from Alaskans, using the pipeline as a financial instrument to manipulate the tariff and conceal their real costs and profits. It's ironic because the Alaskan pipeline is seen as all Alaskan and all American, but the primary owner is British Petroleum, a multinational oil firm with little allegiance to either Alaskans or Americans. And so this takes us back to the election of Jay Hammond in 1974. And I really want to underscore how kind of mind-boggling of an event this was. I mean, Hammond won by literally, uh, bo in both of his elections, he only won by something like hundreds of votes each time, right? Votes, yeah. yeah. Um, and this is an event that I think it's hard to imagine this happening before 1974 or after his tenure. It's, it's very extraordinary. So two questions here. Um, well, the, the main question is, uh, how exactly did Hammond manage to get elected, right? Integrity. Th that's, a, okay, that's a great place to start. So I would argue there's three reasons, right? Hammond's character. He's a very unique individual. Um, the second thing was that he ran on saving Alaska's petroleum wealth. He ran on what are we going to do with our slice of the pie. And the third thing is the, really the unique political timing of 1974 in that situation. So Hammond epitomized the ideal of an Alaskan settler. And I mean this in the context of settler colonialism, of Anglos coming to the state of Alaska and, and forging a new life for themselves in the harsh Alaskan wilderness. Hammond served as a Marine Corps aviator in the famed Black Sheep Squadron uh, in the South Pacific during World War II. Following the end of his service, the young veteran made his way to Alaska in a rickety amphibious biplane. The ex-Marine worked as a fur trapper and dog sled, uh, by dog sled and laborer until he injured his back and enrolled at UAF on the GI Bill in 1949. Uh, he graduated with a degree in biology and went to work as a professional hunter for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He actually hunted wolves. Um, Hammond eventually made southwestern Alaska his home and went into business guiding hunting and fishing trips. Uh, as many of you know, he also homesteaded Lake Clark, which became his lifelong Walden Pond. Uh, as one commentator noted, Hammond was pure Alaskan. He, em he embodied all of these ideas and mythologies that people had about Alaskans and who they should be. In his TV commercial, a uh, very famous TV commercial that some of you might remember, he literally just split wood on the commercial, and people loved it. It was a sensation. <laughs> and, and so many of the commercials that we see, uh, not only in Alaska and throughout the lower 48, I think harken back to this ideal of you know, this rugged individual and whether somebody's firing a gun or splitting an ax. I think some of that comes back to Jay Hammond and, and the iconography that he put out into the world. Second, Hammond's unlikely victory came at a unique political moment. Alaskans elected Hammond with his ideas about combating special interests in saving non-renewable oil wealth at a moment when the intensity and social disruption of pipeline construction dominated the state. In, in a 1974 uh, op-ed in the Anchorage Daily News, um, noted that while Alaskans had typically supported development of almost any kind, quote, things have now changed. This year of the pipeline is also a political year, a time for candidates to consider the questions of uncharted growth, of ill-conceived promises that fulfill only bureaucrats, or developers' dreams and do nothing to improve the quality of our lives." End quote. To clarify, that's the Anchorage Daily News who's saying that. The pipeline boom brought long lines, crime, prostitution, inflation, housing shortages, organized crime, and all manner of social disruption that negatively impacted residents' quality of life, and in no place more so than Fairbanks. Alaskans were also expecting the construction of the Alaska gas pipeline soon after TAPS, which only added to citizens' uncertainty. During the pipeline boom, it was common uh, to see bumper stickers with sentiments like, happiness is a Texan headed south with an oaky under each arm. Actually, it was 10,000. 10, 10,000. 10, <laughs> precisely, precisely. Um, finally, Hammond won because he campaigned on preserving a large chunk of Alaska's petroleum wealth. He argued that Alaskans should learn from the past and save as much oil money as possible. Hammond envisioned turning non-renewable oil 
revenues from the pipeline into, sustainable, into a sustainable revenue source for the future of all Alaskans. While the permanent fund had many progenitors, Jay Hammond was uniquely responsible for ensuring the, the fund emerged how and when it did. The permanent fund was the centerpiece of his policy framework for Alaska's future. Um, and I think it's important as I go forward and talk about how Jay Hammond saw this, how the permanent, uh, how Jay Hammond saw the permanent fund. I think it's important to think about that as we consider how we want to move forward as a state and the potential to uh, perhaps reclaim some of its promise, even if there were unintended consequences. His vision, his vision for the permanent fund had three defining attributes. First, he argued the permanent fund had a conservative political purpose, small c, to stop the growth of bureaucracy and the power of special interests. Hammond sought to protect Alaska from the kind of commercial development that had dominated other oil-rich states like North Dakota. He worried well-connected, quote-unquote, supergrowthers would utilize the state's oil revenues to fuel parochial, environmentally unsound, and uh, what he called uneconomic growth that needed state subsidies to survive. This crony capitalism and its twin of bloated bureaucracy threatened Alaskans' quality of life. Quote, we must, we must stem the tide of unhealthy government expansion, he argued, by limiting its growth to that which people want enough to pay for as they go, end quote. Ultimately, Hammond sought to protect citizens not only from corrupt politicians and crony capitalists, but from oil wealth corrupt, corrupting the very purpose of public policy. Second, Hammond viewed the permanent fund as a vehicle to create a multi-generational sustainable resource economy for Alaska. Multi-generational sustainable resource economy for Alaska. The green governor encouraged Alaskans to distinguish between capital and income. I think he learned this from E.F. Schumacher, the great, uh, the famous uh, ecological economist in the 70s, but I have no proof for that. Um, the state's fortuitous ocean of oil constituted a non-renewable capital asset that should not be treated as sustainable income in its raw form. You know, you had to move the oil wealth into a, uh, into a savings account and then live off of that interest or grow that interest. But if you just spent the oil wealth, you'd find yourself 20 years from then with nothing left over. Not long after the pipeline began moving oil, he warned that the state was relying on a dangerous 61% dependence on inappropriate one-time oil wealth. I think we can all laugh at that 61% number because uh, ever since then it's gone sky high and, and has not returned back down. Um, for Hammond, this was both a bad precedent to subsidize government expenses with non-renewable resource and a theft from future generations. He emphasized, quote, most Alaskans realize that capital wealth from depleting non-renewable resources belong not only to this generation of Alaskans, but also to those who come behind us, end quote. Only by saving this uh, resource wealth in a permanent fund could Alaskans transform oil into a renewable intergenerational asset. Third, and I think this is very important and, and by and large neglected when folks look at Hammond. Um, he, this was a profoundly environmental vision. He saw both the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend as a way to strengthen Alaska's renewable resources and to prepare the state for the day when Alaska had to survive on only those renewable resources and no longer oil. And so this is, uh, this is a quote from one of his speeches he gave, and I think it's worth reading or quoting in full. I believe Alaska's best long-term future lies with its increased dependence on renewable resources fisheries, timber, agriculture, and tourism. To assure the uh, viability of these industries requires that money derived from short, the short-term exploitation of our non-renewable resources be invested in the enhancement, rehabilitation, or expansion of these resource potentials. The proposed permanent fund is the first signpost to the future which indicates we've learned some lessons from the past. From it, we should be able to buy a piece of that future for our kids instead of simply burning higher octane fuel in a compulsive race to get there. So
So Hammond believed Alaskans fundamentally faced a choice between, quote, whether our money feeds an unhealthy, cancerous growth in Alaska or sustains a more reasonably healthy, smaller scale economy. Growth was not the end all for Hammond, but rather a mechanism through which to achieve a higher quality of life. He was constantly saying, growth to what end? Do we want a growth in more ambulances and hospitals if it just means that you know, the population is, is sicker? And you know, this was a, Hammond was a, an individual, uh, like somebody like Bobby Kennedy, who questioned this GDP number and whether or not that accurately reflected the wealth and welfare of the people. And for Hammond and countless others, what made Alaska so unique was the land and its sustainable resources. Quote, Alaska is truly a gift outright, he explained. It is a gift that keeps giving to the generations of Alaskans who follow. We have perhaps the scarcest of all resources, the potential for land-related lifestyles of a different, simpler time, to which Alaskans would cling passionately and to which many other Americans would hearken back, end quote. And so the irony about all this is when Hammond was elected and before oil began to flow, and even, even first when it started to flow, Alaskans seemed far more willing and able to envision a future beyond oil than we even do today. And that's something, that, um, something to think about. And so with Hammond's uh, insistence, um, after a couple of fits and starts, in 1976, Alaskans passed a constitutional amendment to make uh, the permanent fund a, uh, a part of state governance. Um, and the effect of this was to effectively save 10% of all mineral revenues. In the constitutional amendment, it says 25%, but that doesn't include a severance tax, so it's basically 10% of all of Alaska's oil wealth went in there, plus any additions that the legislature added over the years. And so the timing of the permanent fund proved critical. Contrary to some claims, the permanent fund was not created when Alaska was reaping so much uh, oil wealth it scarcely knew what to do with it. Rather, the fund was created when Alaska was quite poor, literally surviving off of a loan from the oil companies with high hopes that the completion of the pipeline would make it wealthy. As we shall see, this contrasts sharply with the repeal of the income tax in 1980. And so this gets us to the, the PFD, the second major pillar in, in uh, Hammond's uh, plan for the state of Alaska. And you know, Hammond, um, you know, he was governor for two terms. And you can basically think about the first term of his, um, uh, of his agenda as creating the permanent fund. And his uh, second four-year stint was all about the permanent fund dividend. Um, Shortly after the 1976 election, Hammond put forward his first idea for distributing the earnings and protecting the principal of the permanent fund. His plan was called Alaska Inc. or Alaska Incorporated, and it dispersed half the fund's earnings directly to citizens based on their length of residency in the state. So it had that temporal component. And I also think it's really important because when Hammond came out with this plan, people thought he was crazy. You're going to give the oil wealth directly to the people? Um, and I also, I think that's important because as we envision a renewable and regenerative economy moving forward, don't forget the last time people said, oh, you Alaskans are crazy to think about that idea. And so Hammond's plan was, uh, Hammond's vision was to empower citizens to be stakeholders in the owner state. He wanted to make the owner state a personal concept. In this sense, Hammond advocated a kind of shareholder democracy. He argued for larger grants to long-term residents because they had owned the state's mineral wealth longer and had borne the burdens of the state's high cost of living, unemployment, and harsh environment for longer. Um, these long-term residents had also contributed the most to the, state's, to the young state's development. And so there's a sense in which he actually saw the permanent fund dividend as a kind of environmental compensation for those folks who lived in Alaska. Quote, part of my rationale for paying dividends, Hammond recalled, was to help offset the nation's highest cost of living. It seemed grossly unfair to not compensate old timers for the 21 years they'd lived in Alaska, bearing those costs before their oil was developed, end quote. Indeed, the PFD was originally called a heritage payment. Its name was only changed right before it was passed. 
Hammond not only sought to compensate old timers, he wanted to discourage giveaways that would attract newcomers from immigrating to Alaska. This uh, conformed with his conservationist view that Alaska should not seek to increase its population. Thus, Alaska Inc. was profoundly concerned with intergenerational justice. It sought to ensure both that old timers were compensated for their perseverance and that Alaska's oil wealth would become an intergenerational asset. The plan envisioned paying residents $50 a year for up to 20 years that they had lived here, they had resided in the state. Thus, the maximum payout would have been $1,000. If you had lived in the state 20 or more years, right? Consistent with his slow growth and quality of living perspective, Hammond argued this temporally accrued dividend encourage longer term thinking. He thought the dividend would invest citizens in the function of their government and incentivize them to protect the fund. Finally, he saw the program as especially beneficial to native and rural residents since it would allow them to maintain their subsistence way of living. In the end, as you are all aware, Hammond's Alaska Inc. plan did not come to pass. Fearing it would be ruled unconstitutional, which it was, Hammond and the Alaska legislature passed a backstop bill that dispersed permanent fund earnings to each Alaskan resident regardless of how many years they had lived in the state. This is obviously the program we have today. Um, Hammond almost, almost vetoed that backstop plan because he so vehemently disliked that the dividend was not based on the number of years living in Alaska. Um, but he, he also realized this was the only way to get it through. So at the end of the day, he passed it despite his misgivings. And so all of this was kind of Hammond's vision for how to create a sustainable polity out of Alaska's oil wealth. But there was a number of unintended consequences, not only with his own plan, but for unforeseen events that he did not think about. Following the Iranian Revolution in 1979 and the second oil crisis, Alaska's oil revenues skyrocketed into the billions of dollars suddenly and unexpectedly. The average wellhead price of Alaska North Slope crude jumped from roughly $5 per barrel in 1978 to $26 in March of 1981. As uh, state petroleum revenue skyrocketed um, and there appeared to be enough oil to do almost anything. In reaction, members of the public um, organized a petition to eliminate the income tax. The legislature had already un undertaken a partial reduction in taxes for the 1978, 79, and 80 tax years, but citizens agitated for more relief. Most Alaskan legislators supported this push. Libertarian State Representative Dick Randolph of Fairbanks <laughs> led the effort to repeal the income tax. Ironically, Randolph was a fierce opponent of the owner state arguing that Alaska's con the Alaska Constitution's public ownership clause was an enormous detriment to the private economy. So, you know, he didn't think Alaskans should be getting any of this, uh, this direct payout from the permanent fund or the permanent fund dividend. Only a few politicians opposed abolishing the income tax. They included Jay Hammond, Clem Tillian, and John Butrovich, an elder statement, statesman who had served in the territorial legislature when it first passed uh, the income tax in 1949. And there's a really fantastic uh, short history um, that I would uh, recommend it by historian Terence Cole. It's called Blinded by Riches. And it really discusses uh, the Alaska legislature fought so hard in the late 1940s to enact an income tax, literally for 10 years. And that was part of proof that we are mature enough citizens uh, to tax ourselves, therefore we should get our own state. You know, it was, it was part of the basis of state citizenship. <laughs> Hammond, so Hammond warned that, quote, once repealed, we'll never get the income tax back until we've raided all other revenue sources and or traumatically cut even the most crucial state programs, end quote. Like the permanent fund dividend, the governor believed that income taxes connected citizens with the government and gave them a vested interest in overseeing bureaucracy. Quote, the public needed to be able to say, what are those idiots doing with our tax dollars? <clears throat> While many saw the oil revenues as a fantastic and enduring surplus, Hammond had his doubts. Repealing the income tax might be fine if we had other sustainable income dollars to supplant those we'd lose, he reasoned, but we don't. Instead, of simply, um, instead, we'd simply replace those sustainable tax dollars 
with your non-sustainable oil wealth and at the same time speed us towards the day we'd finally go broke. Despite his misgivings in 1980, Hammond signed the bill repealing the state's income tax. He signed the bill because he knew that the legislature would override his veto. I didn't have the guts to veto it, which I should have done, he recalled. <laughs> Hammond said signing the income tax repeal was the biggest mistake of his tenure. The repeal of the income tax changed the trajectory of the petro welfare state. Hammond created the permanent fund and PFD as financial instruments for turning petro wealth into a sustainable economy. But the repeal of the income tax made the Alaska state less self-reliant and less capable of moving beyond oil. Hammond's shareholder democracy mixed with Randolph's libertarian vision to produce a strange political amalgamation. The income tax had been the government's primary source of recurring revenue since enacted in 1949. The repeal of the income tax meant that non-Alaskan corporations paid most of the state's taxes and kept the government functioning. It meant that the state's budget was precariously reliant on world oil prices over which the state of Alaska had almost no control. And this graph is a re really interesting because the peak year for the Alaska pipeline in North Slope production was in 1988. The pipeline moved 2.1 million barrels per day. The state did not make the most money in that year because world oil prices were depressed. But the state of Alaska had no ability con to control the flow of its oil through the pipeline. One can imagine an alternative future where Alaska had a, state, a stake in the pipeline and could have slowed down oil production until prices would have risen and the residents of Alaska would have financially benefited far more from that arrangement. The state of Alaska became financially dependent on revenues from a single industry that flowed through a single pipeline system. As my friend Julianne Warren argues, it made the state's finances a petroleum monoculture. At the same time, the pipeline connected the North Slope oil fields to downstream markets. The petroleum revenues worked to disconnect citizens from their government. With the revocation of the income tax, Alaskans no longer effectively paid for their government. Alaskans had far less direct state in how state dollars were spent other than protecting their PFD checks. Scholars have argued that the disconnect between citizens and the state is common in nations or states rich with oil and gas. States that are able to generate revenue from oil and gas are less reliant on their citizens. Of course, this relationship has changed as oil revenues have dried up. And I think what we're seeing in the state of Alaska today is really refreshing because people are becoming very involved with their government. Advocates of Alaskan statehood argued and recognized that income taxes were central to self-government and a stable economy. They recognized, according to historian Terence Cole, that without taxation, there would be no representation. That is, those who paid for government would dominate governance. It wasn't just the repeal of the income tax that derailed Hammond's vision to use oil wealth to create an economy that could one day move beyond oil. His own dividend program, for all its egalitarian and beneficial outcomes, had unexpected consequences. Historian Terence Cole argues that the dividend became, quote, the tail that wags the dog. Rather than just a mechanism to protect the principle of the permanent fund, the dividend became an end in itself. For many Alaskans, the very purpose of the fund. The dividend program did not create a constituency to protect the permanent fund. It became a constituency to protect the PFD. After all, Hammond intended the permanent fund to be a renewable resource to help sustain Alaska beyond oil. But many argue the dividend has, made this, has only made this transition harder. I want to conclude by reflecting on three enduring ironies of the petro welfare state that continue to dominate Alaska's economy. First, the petro welfare state was constructed primarily um, by those interested in moving the state away from oil. They were most concerned with sustainable resources, quality of life, and environmental conservation. Alaskans cherished, these, the, cherished the political reforms Hammond championed, namely the permanent fund of PFD, yet have refused to elect another leader of his conservationist character. Second, striving to free themselves from the bonds of taxation Alaskans now made themselves more dependent than ever on outside interests. A narrower tax base and the world's price of oil now determined Alaska's fate far more than any other metric. The state's budget became almost totally reliant on the fluctuations of the global oil market, 
which the state and its citizens had almost no control over. Third, and we see this especially reflecting and memorializing the 30th anniversary of the Exxon Valdez disaster. The state became rich while sacrificing those things that made it truly wealthy. It's biological resources, the engagement of its citizens, and the teeming environment of Prince William Sound. Exxon British, uh, Exxon British Petroleum, ConocoPhillips, and Alaska have all stressed that what's good for big oil is good for Alaska. But the past 40 years demonstrates that Alaskans' real wealth and independence have never flowed from oil or the pipeline. Thank you. <laughs>